All right, if you would please look in your Bibles in Acts chapter 16. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to give you the context of the passage, and then we'll preach to you a little bit here from this and make some application today. I believe this is exactly where the Lord would have us to be this Sunday morning, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for each of you of being in attendance today, and again, really looking forward to what the Lord has for us here on this day. Let's pray. Father in heaven, again, we come to you now recognizing our great need for you, Lord, without you, we can do nothing. And so today, Lord, we desire that very much you would have your way in all that's said and done. And Lord, that it would be glorifying to your name. Lord, that it would be edifying to your people. And then, Lord, if there's one today who does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, Lord, as Brother Peter just sang a moment ago, Lord, that they would today come through the door. Lord, that they would step in. Lord, that they would believe on you. Lord, they would recognize that you do stand ready to receive them. And we're rejoicing in that. Lord, bless now in all things said and done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're here in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 16, and we're uh, looking at the life of the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> Those of you that were a part of our Wednesday night Bible study, I suppose it's been months ago now, maybe a year or so ago, we went through systematically and chronologically and considered the life of Paul, and we approached this passage. But So I'll review some things maybe that you, you heard then, but for others, maybe this will be a reminder of some things along the way. It might be new for you. But uh, Paul was a man who was a Jew. He was a person who was brought up in the law, and he was a zealot for that. And he was in that, he was at the top of his game. Boy, the Lord Jesus and the Christians, the believers, they really rubbed him the wrong way. He thought they were blasphemers, and he went about persecuting them. And in the book of Acts, God does something. He turns that man's life around. He takes him from being one who was persecuting believers, those who are following the Lord Jesus Christ. He takes him uh, on the road to Damascus, where he is actually traveling to go and to take people and imprison them. The Lord Jesus appears to him, and there the Lord saves him. And then the Lord commissions him to be an apostle or to be a spokesman for God to the Gentiles. And the term Gentile speaks of those who are non-Jewish folks. And so a Jewish man who had been steeped in the law, now turned around by the Lord Jesus Christ and aimed and directed to go to the Gentile world and to preach the gospel to them. Hey, I'm thankful today for gospel preachers. I'm thankful today for people like Paul who took the charge and took the call and carried the gospel. I'm thankful today that we're gathering in a local assembly. Uh, oh, culture, a little bit different. Maybe the style of our buildings are different. What we have available to use is different, but very much the same thing. God's people coming together on the Lord's Day, making much of Jesus Christ, being a testimony to the world of what someday will take place when all believers are caught up out of this world, letting the world see that we believe in Christ, letting the world see that we worship Him. And today we've come and we're opening His Word. We've had a good time in music. And music's important to our service. It's important in preparing our heart. And now we come to the time of opening God's Word and breaking this bread, the bread of life, God's Word, and learning from it. Acts tells us that Paul went from one who persecuted to one who was aimed at preaching the gospel. Man, the Lord really did great things in his life. By this point in his life, he spent some time alone with the Lord Jesus in the wilderness learning. And then he came back and he served inside of his local church. And then he was commissioned with another man by the name of Barnabas to go out on what was considered their first missionary journey. And they would go into a place called Galatia, and there would be churches established there, and also to the island of Cyprus. And they would go, and churches would be established. And boy, the Lord really worked. There were situations that came up, and they needed to get answers. Because the book of Acts is a book of transition. We're bringing not only are the Jewish folks getting saved, but Gentiles are getting saved, and they're coming together in assemblies. And at times there was a little bit of questions about what do we do? How do we get along? How do we function in this? And so after they've taken that first journey, they've come home to their home base. They've got some questions answered. And Paul says to Barnabas, let's go on a second trip here and let's establish those churches. And that's what Paul is doing here at this point. There's a little bit of a separation between Paul and Barnabas. Barnabas will go on with someone else to Cyprus and Paul will begin to travel with others like Silas, and then we'll see here also a fellow by the name of Timothy. They'll jo join him on his second trip. And so he'll go and he'll start by visiting those churches that he had seen established. And now he's kind of in a crossroads. He's gone to the edge. If we were looking at a map, he's gone to the edge of some land and 
He's gone to the north and the Lord won't give him peace to stay there. He's gone to the south and the Lord won't give him peace to stay there. And now he's in a place called Troas. And while he's there kind of wanting to know what God wants him to do, the Lord appears to him. Let me make a couple of observations. First of all, the Lord gives directions to those who follow them. Let me explain that to you. The Lord gives directions to those who follow them. You say, don't mistake that. The Bible's full of directions. Absolutely, there are plenty of things to be directed in. But the Lord really delights when His people take His directions and follow them. And you know what happens? It's kind of like working with somebody, working with a student, teacher. You're giving everybody the same information, right? But some folks are doing what with it? They're taking it in. They're soaking it in. And the teacher delights and wants to go further with the student who's receiving the information and applying the information. Paul was getting a lot of information, a lot of instructions from the Lord, but there's something special about Paul and his relationship with the Lord. He's not just getting those instructions, but he's following them. The Lord is looking for surrendered, obedient people. That's something I can be. I can be surrendered. I can follow the admonition in the book of Romans. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you do what? That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Everybody here today who knows the Lord Jesus Christ is their Savior, every one of us ought to make that commitment. You can say, preacher, it's a one-time thing. We can say it's a daily thing. I don't care how you label it. Just make sure you do it. We could be presenting our bodies on a regular basis to the Lord saying, Hey, I am thine, O Lord. I am thine. I want to be a vessel used by God. I am surrendered. Hey, tomorrow morning before you walk into the workplace, say, Lord, I'm surrendered today to live for you, to exalt you, and to be a witness for you today. Ladies and gentlemen in your home today, when you go home, say, Lord, I am surrendered that in this home that I would be used by you, Lord, to be a vessel of honor. And God, I desire that you would take my life and that you would use it. You say, well, that's for the preacher. No, that's for all of God's people to be surrendered to Him. Surrendered and then what? Obedient. Well, as the Lord deals with your heart when you're sitting in church and you hear preaching or you're opening your Bible and you're reading that and God begins to deal with your heart and He begins to work here. And He says, now listen, I'm doing something here and I want it to come out. I want to bear fruit in your life. I want that to be expressed. And the Spirit of God begins to communicate with us. Maybe it's in that topic that we spoke of the last couple of weeks. Charity and giving and loving. And not just for what people can do for us, but loving because of who God is and what God has done in our lives. Having that action in our life of giving and displaying that. Being obedient in that. More hope over the last couple of weeks that maybe you've gone out in life and you've demonstrated that. We went through all those different expressions of love and the experience of love. I hope that you would allow the Spirit of God to take that and that that would make a difference in your life. Letting God bear fruit in your life. Why? So that you can get a pat on the back and people can say, wow, he's a really good Christian. No. So you can point him to Jesus and say, I have a really great Savior and He loved me and He saved me and He's not giving up on me and He's working in my life and He's using my life for His glory and for His purpose. Paul was surrendered. Paul was obedient. And Paul was searching. He wanted to be used by God. I don't expect that the Lord is going to send you like He did the, to Apostle Paul to a place where the gospel has never been preached, but He might. He might. There's some young folks in the room today, and maybe there's some not-so-young folks. Some, what is young? It's just a matter of mind, isn't it? How many of you at times are feeling not so young, right? But oh, listen... He might. There could be a young man, young lady sitting here today listening to the preacher preach, understanding and recognizing the importance of that and being surrendered to the Lord. And the Lord might come along and touch your heart and lead you and direct you to go someplace today in the world where the gospel is not preached. Think of all the churches you passed this morning coming here. Think of all the churches that we have in America. And I want to remind you that there are places all around the world where they do not know that. That is not their life experience. Maybe God would take you there, allow you to have that privilege to serve Him in that capacity. And Paul is a missionary. Paul's a church planner. He's a lot of things. He's surrendered. He's obedient. And he wants to be directed. And so he's considering this area and that area, but the Lord will not allow him. The Spirit of God suffered him not, verse 7 says. But then something happened in verse 9. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Now listen, the Bible is your vision. 
The Lord has given us a vision. Just as much as Paul got a vision, we've got a vision. It's right here. When the Lord Jesus said, Go ye into all the world and to preach the gospel and to teach all nations, what was He giving us? He was giving us a vision for missions. He was giving us a, a vision for a living, right? When the Bible says, And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. That's a vision. That's a vision of what the Spirit of God wants to do in your life and in your relationships. He's showing you what He would have for you. The Bible says that where there is no vision, the people perish. When we put that statement in its context, it's dealing with the Word of God. Where the Word of God is not being applied, where the Word of God is not being seen, where the Word of God is not being followed, where there is no vision of God's expectation, then that creates problems for us. And there are times, no doubt, where, the God, where God deals with us in particular ways and gives us insight into a specific purpose that He would have for us. So Paul receives a vision, but I would remind you first that he was surrendered. He was obedient, right? Hey, he was looking. He was desiring to be used of God. It doesn't take a genius to figure it out. You're standing at the gas station. You're pumping your gas. You've asked the Lord that morning, Lord, give me opportunity today to be an effective witness for you. Lord, allow me the opportunity to cross paths with someone that I might be able to share the gospel with. There you are at the gas pump. Someone pulls up and they begin to get gas right alongside of you. There's that awkward moment where you both look at each other. And you begin to go about your business. You're pumping your gas. Hey, why not reach into your pocket and pull out a track? And why not hand that to that person? And why don't you say something like this? Let me tell you, let me give you the best news you'll ever receive. But you say, preacher, what if they don't receive it? Well, I'm not doing it for them. I'm doing it for the Lord because the Lord's called me to be a witness for Him, right? If they won't receive it, here's sometimes what I'll say to folks. Well, would you take it and give it to somebody that will? Now listen, I'm going to tell you, very, very few people refuse that. Now you're going to come back on next week and tell me they turned the gas pump on you and covered you with gas. But I'm not going to believe you, all right, because it's never happened to me. But you could do that. Hey, you're walking to the gas station there, and there's that person that's working at the register, or wherever it may be, or that person sitting alongside of you in the doctor's office, or you've gotten on the elevator at the hospital. You're going to visit somebody. They're there for some reason. You reach into your pocket. You pull out a track for them. We have a nice track for caregivers. And we designed so when you're at the hospital or the nursing home to give it to every nurse there is and every person working in the hospital. Next time you go, hey, make a game out of it. Take those opportunities and seize those moments and put the gospel in somebody's hand. Desire that God would use you. Hey, that's what Paul was doing and that's what, what the Lord accomplished in Paul's life. And he could do the very same thing in yours. And so here comes the vision in our text this morning. Look at me, would you please? Verse 9, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia. You don't know who this man is. Never tells us in the scripture. We know that Paul will encounter people when he comes to Macedonia, but there's no specific person mentioned here. People speculate about who it is, who what he looked like. We do not know. He is a picture or a symbol of what? He's a symbol of the people of Macedonia. Of course, Macedonia is a part of Greece, which is a part of Europe. Many folks here today, you would find today your heritage having come from Europe. That means this. And what's getting ready to happen here is the Lord in such a gracious way is going to get the gospel the best news that you and I could ever hear. The news that changes our lives, but more than that, changes our eternal destination. The Lord's getting ready to open a door for the gospel to come over. And so, come over to Macedonia and help us. Eventually, not only will Paul go to Macedonia, but he'll travel through that region, and eventually he'll end up in Rome, and he'll take the gospel there. It's an entrance for the gospel to come someplace that had never been a place steeped in Thoughts and wisdom and paganism and all the different cultural experience that they had, but not having the real truth, the real light that changes lives and changes lives from the inside out. They had physical. They had that figured out. They had Olympics. They had games. They had the mental. They had schools. They had, they had already began to put together philosophy. They had the mind and the body, but friend, they didn't have an answer for this. They didn't have an answer for the heart condition. And what's getting ready to happen is the Lord's going to introduce the gospel to them. I want you to see here just a few simple observations. You will not today walk away and say, boy, that is the most intelligent preacher that I've ever heard. But I hope today you'll hear the word of God and the word of God will burn in your heart as it has in mine. I don't know how long, but probably the last seven days, these two words have just ate me up. They have burned in my mind. Help us. 
help us. When I was involved in ministry this week and picking people up, young people up and bringing them to church, I heard it over and over again. Help us. Help us. We reached young people yesterday morning for overcomers ministry. As I saw the young people coming on, I heard, help us. As I went to nursing homes and hospitals this week, as we knocked on doors this week, I heard, help us. As missionaries called and we communicated with them about needs on the mission field and our brother Rice getting back to the Philippines this week, uh, the dear servant of God there for many, many years, I heard in his voice, whether he said it or not, I heard the cry that comes, help us. You see, this is a cry that's not always heard by everyone. This is a cry that is not a cry that the natural man would hear. This is a cry that the spiritual man would hear when he looks upon the needs of the world, looks upon the needs of his neighbor, looks upon the needs of his loved ones, and he hears, help us. It's not always verbalized. It's not always known. It's not always recognized by those that are around you. But that cry echoes, help us us. In the gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 9, a man came to the disciples while Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. He brought with him his son, whom the Lord would later ask, how long has he had this problem? And he said, since he was a child. So we're really not sure of his age. But the father would come to the disciples seeking help. His son had been troubled by an evil spirit, by a devil, and uh, he came to the disciples and they weren't able to help him. And so then Jesus steps in and asks, what's going on? And this man says something. He brought his son to him. But he asked this question of the Lord. He does not say, help my son. He said, help us. Help us. Do you understand that when a son is troubled, so is a father. Do you understand when a mother is troubled, so is a daughter. You are looking into a world today where there is trouble, where there is sin, where there is consequence, where there is hopelessness. And there is a cry that comes to our ears today. Help us! Help us! When Paul sensed it to the leading of the Lord, he heard and he saw that man, that man of Macedonia, representing what? Representing that whole group, that whole area. Help us! When he heard that cry. He said, immediately, we're setting the sail. It's time to go there. And I want to give you just a several simple points. First of all, what did he hear? He heard the cry of help us. But in order to do that, first of all, there was the call to do this. Come over. Come over. Friend, we must get over pride. We must get over pride. We must get over being the big shot. We must get over having it our way. We must surrender We communicated on the topic of charity. We talked about what charity is not. We talked about what charity is. And charity is selfless, right? Seeketh not her own. Friend, if we're going to help them, we've got to come over. We've got to get over pride. We've got to get over those tasks that that are beneath me. If you're going to help people, if you're going to reach people, man, we've all got to jump in 110% and say, bless God, I'm willing to do whatever is necessary to help folks. If out there today in front of the church there was a terrible accident, and I hope that there will not be now, but if there were and there were people who were hurting, if there was an automobile that was in a dangerous situation, we would not all stand around and say, hey, I'm too important. Would you please go and help them? I hope that we would all stand up and rush to the need, and we would all begin to administer what help is needed. And I'm trying to tell you today that there is a world today where young people are taking their lives. I'm trying to tell you today that there are countries and there are nations who are lost without Christ. They've never heard the gospel. They don't know what you know. They've never heard of grace. They don't know of mercy. They don't know of the old rugged cross. And that call comes to us to help us. And friend, we've got to come over. We've got to get up. We've got to move on past pride. Ain't one of us too big for the work of God. There's not one of us that these things are beneath us. Our Savior demonstrated charity when He washed the feet of His disciples. He washed the feet of those that would flee and scatter in His darkest hour. He was kind to those who would forsake Him and betray Him, demonstrating to us, we must come over. We must come over. We must come over pride. May I say we must come over prejudice. 
We must come over. I'm concerned about this group of people and not that group of people. Hey, God is concerned about all people. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You say there are some groups of people who are easier. Maybe that's the case. There seems to be an open door in certain mission fields and in other doors they are seemingly closed. But oh, I hope there's somebody who have a heart for the one and for that group that's not so easy. Don't always go for the easy route. I've been shocked in my life in ministry that people who looked the meanest and the baddest and the toughest were the tenderest and most ready to receive. Now listen, culturally, we've had a cultural shift of the norms, right? When we look at things there, we go, wow, what in the world? And I'm not saying it's right, I'm just saying it's reality. You, you be careful that you don't look past somebody because they didn't have a good parent or a good daddy or a good mommy to help them to understand proper behavior. They didn't get manners like we did. They didn't have it in the school. You did, I did. You had people telling you how to behave and how to, how to handle yourself. You know, there's a lot of times folks don't have that anymore. You're going to look past them. Don't do it. Hear the cry. Hear it from all places, all generations. What? Help us. Come over pride. Come over prejudice. Come over personal limitations. Well, you know, preach, I, you know, I am. That's for other people to do. Listen, friend, if you're a born again child of God, then the Spirit of God's living inside of you. And just as He took Peter, who was a fisherman, who was a man who was perceived by his peers to be unlearned and ignorant, but full of the Holy Ghost, and God made him one of the most powerful preachers that you and I will ever read about. If God would use Peter that way, then God would help us that way. We must come over personal limitations. We must come over personal expectations. I don't think I'd be any good at teaching that class. I don't think I'd be any good at teaching or preaching down at the mission or down at the jail. Hey, listen, it's never been about you. It's always been about Him. Greater is He that is in you than he that is in the world. Yield to Him. Submit to Him. Be surrendered to Him. Be obedient to Him. Hear the cry, help us and come over. Well, oh, I'd rather have a poor, hobbled witness than no witness. You think somebody involved in the tragic accident is real worried about everything you know and don't know? You're there to help them. It may be you get them to a point where you have to turn them over, but you say, bless God, I'll do all I can to get you as far as I can, and we'll go from there. If you're waiting for some sort of degree, if you're waiting for some sort of word of knowledge, you've got everything you need in the Word of God and in the person of the Holy Spirit living within you. Come over! Come over. Come over pride. Come over prejudice. Come over personal limitations. Uh, personal uh, excuses. Come over personal comfort. Let's be willing to give up some things, shall we? Well, we are a blessed, almost too much generation. Look at what we've got. You be careful now. Our young people have got things today, and have, they are living at a, 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 a level, an unprecedented level of comfort and ease. There is a spirit of entitlement. There is a spirit of, I've got to have that. And I fear if we do not help them in our homes, I fear if we do not teach them and direct them and show them and give them opportunities to give and even experience self-sacrifice of giving of some things of their own, then they'll miss this quality. Consider how good we have it. Consider the luxuries that we enjoy. Well, listen, we've got to be willing to come over personal comforts. Give up some of your time. Give up some of your time. Time is a valuable commodity. I treasure it. As a pastor, I'm very careful to not waste your time. We start things, attempt to start things when we should. We try to end things when we should. We lock things in that way. Why? Because time is valuable. It's a commodity. I can't get it back. You ask that person this week whose loved one went to be with the Lord, well, hey, what would you give for an hour? And I get it. Time is valuable. So don't squander it. Don't waste it. Don't just use it and spend it on things that don't matter. Put some time into some things that have eternal value and eternal importance. Come over that. Self-comfort, come over that. Find some way to be engaged in ministry. Find some way to be engaged in that. You see, we hear that cry, help us, and at times we feel helpless. I hear so often people say, look at the world. The world's falling apart. Well, what can I do about it? Give me a Starbucks. 
What in the world can I do about it? I'm up to level 110. But you're not doing nothing about it that way. What can you do about it? I'm going to tell you how you can do something about it. Because God gives it, so I'm just going to stir you up to give you nothing to do. There's something that I can do about it. There is something I can do every day of my life. I am not helpless, and I am not hopeless. Why? Because I know the man with the answers. I know the man with the plan. And he's got a good plan. If we'll obey him and be surrendered to him and follow him, we'll not be helpless, we'll not be hopeless, but we'll make a difference. And some having compassion, doing what? Making a difference. We said here, come over. And I want you to notice the next statement. Into Macedonia. Come to where people are. Well, I'm so glad you came to church today. Thrilled by that. Look forward to it every Sunday morning, standing in the lobby, walking the aisle, shaking hands. Good to see folks. So glad for that. And I wouldn't change anything about that. But I want to tell you something. There's more out there than are in here. And we come here to be together. To get charged up to do what? To go out there. To go out there. There's a lost and dying world. There are people today looking for answers. There are people today, they don't even know yet what the real issue is. They've got to have somebody guide them and help them, to instruct them in that, to know. We have got to do what? Be willing to not only come over, but enter into it, into Macedonia. Leave where you're at. And so Paul had to get on a ship and he had to travel over. He had to cross over and go into meet people and be involved with folks that he'd never been involved with before in their land like that. Come over and come in. Hey, I want to encourage you to find some way to, to interact and to push yourself out of your comfort zone to interact with people. I love that song. He came to me. How many of you know it? He came to me. I was driving the bus yesterday. Boy, oh boy, I was missing my, missing my pickups. You know why? I got to singing. And the great thing about singing on a bus is nobody can hear you. The roar of the engine will drown you out. Man, it got good. He came to me. When I could not come to where Jesus was, He came to me. He left the realms of glory. He stepped out of the presence of the angels where they loved Him and they worshipped Him. And He entered into a manger where only shepherds attended. People didn't even know He was there. He was born there and He lived and He walked amongst men and the very people that He loved, the very people He came to, they rejected Him. He went about doing good. He healed the sick. He caused the blind to see the lame to walk. And that very crowd of people stood there because their expectations were wrong and were not met. And they cried out, Crucify Him! You know what He was doing when He went to Calvary? He came to me! He came to me! He humbled Himself! He came over that pride! He came into Macedonia! He left heaven and He stepped into an old sinful world! He came into this old world of ours! And He bore the burden! He loved us! He gave Himself for us! And today, we shout to victory! Why? Because He came to us. Now, the great thing is this. He's given us a pattern. He's given us an opportunity. We can live the same way. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And we touched on it last couple of weeks. Be like Him in that. He came over pride. He humbled Himself. There was no pride in our Savior, but you understand. He came to those and loved those who did not love Him. He came to us. Well, I wonder this week, I wonder what could happen if some of God's people would just say, you know what, I'm going to take what I've got and I'm going to take it. Maybe today there is somebody, maybe there is a young person today who ought to say, you know what, the Lord's been dealing with my heart. I'm willing to leave the comforts of this land. If God would have me, if that's what God would do with me, I would be yielded, I would be surrendered to that. To go somewhere where people don't have the gospel preached. You say, preacher, that's good for the young people. You know what? That's good for all people. Peter was no teenager. Paul was no teenager. 
Maybe there's somebody here, you're steeped in life. Maybe you're in a position finally in life where you've got time and resources where you could. Maybe you ought to look at that mission board up and down the hallway. Maybe it's just simply to call one of them up and say, hey, could I come for a week or two and help you? Could I come help you with vacation Bible school? Is there some way that I could be involved in that? Hey, maybe the Lord would give you a burden for that. Maybe the Lord would call you there. I don't know. But here's the thing. If I'm surrendered to it and I'm willing to, I tell you what, it'd be a lot better experience for you to go and help a missionary for a week than go down to that stinking Disney world and give them all your money. Ouch. Forget I ever said that. I'm moving back. I love you. Huh? Went from preaching to meddling, didn't we? Be better for your kids. I want to help somebody. I've only been in the mission field one time. It's a good thing. Because if I went again, I'd probably never come home. We went down to Mexico and saw Jonathan and Laura Bryan there in the children's homes and preached in those services and saw them started. And friend, man, oh man, there was something about it. And I'm sure there's a romance to it. I understand that. But to see people hearing the language and the gospel from someone who's come to them. I listened this morning in my Sunday school class as someone was teaching and singing in Swahili in the room next door. And I'm, wow. And that's something. There's people all around the world. They could hear the gospel if somebody would go to them. Hey, listen, we, maybe you can't go, but you know what you can do? You can help send people. You ought to get excited about missions. Excited about supporting missionaries. Brother Rice, who went to the Philippines, who we had the tremendous privilege to be a part of his ministry and to be able to get him a vehicle when he gets back. He's going to buy a van, new van there to be able to use in those ministries. Well, he was so excited about that. Well, you'd, you'd have just thought we gave him the... The, the title deed to the country of the Philippines, man, to get a vehicle like that. So excited about that, to use that in ministry. That's just a light thing. To us, but to him, big deal. Maybe you can't go, but you could send somebody. Why don't you cut back on the supersize? And say, you know what? I'll still get the meal. I just won't get the... You, you, I'll be doing you a favor anyhow. I'll cut back to small fries and a small drink and whatever that other portion is, I'm going to give that to a missionary somewhere. We can find ways to do that. Hey, help us! Help us! Come over, get over those things into Macedonia and do what? Help us. Okay, let me get to the message. I promise to be done by 1 o'clock, all right? How in the world, preacher, can I help folks? What can I do? We see a man who was surrendered. We see a man who was obedient. We see a man who was directed by the Lord. We see a man who was willing to come over pride and prejudice and personal limitations, personal comforts and willing to go. We see a man who was willing to come to where people were at and then he offered to them help. What is the help? Are you ready? I'm going to give you three words. Light, might, and right. Light, might, and right. Say that with me, would you please, so I can make sure you're still awake. Light, might, and and right. What do people need? Turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 26 and verse 18 very quickly. Let me preach on these three points. Four poems, two songs, and seven illustrations, and we'll go home. Acts 26 and verse 18. In description of his ministry, we see here the Apostle Paul giving in general terms what his ministry would do, what his help would be. Acts 26 and verse 18. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to what? to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified. And how do we have these things? By faith that is in me. The Lord Jesus given Paul a description of what he's going to do and how he's going to help people. Here they are, three words. Are you ready? How do I help somebody? Number one, they need light. What is the light? The light is the gospel. Whether men recognize it or not, from God's perspective, those who are outside of Christ, those who have not believed on Christ, I'm not talking about people being religious. I'm not talking about people going to church. I'm not talking about people who say they believe in God. The devils believe in God and tremble. I'm talking about people who have had what the Lord Jesus said to that man who came to Him. Men, people have been born again. They've been born into the family of God. Not that they've joined a church and not that they've turned over a new leaf, but there is something that's going on right in here. For with the heart, man believeth unto 
righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. I was there when it happened. I was a junior high boy. I had heard the gospel many, many times before. I could have told you the gospel. I could have sung you the gospel. I could sing Jesus loves me, the B-I-B-L-E. Oh, how I love Jesus. Jesus loves the little children. I could have given you everything there was. I could have given you the books of the Bible. I could have told you the Bible characters. But friend, that is not what saved me. What saved me was sitting in the church and hearing the preacher preach and hearing as he talked about the wheats and the tares and people who have from their heart believed under the, on the Lord Jesus Christ. And I sat there as a church boy, a choir boy, a Christian school boy, as lost as a goose in a snowstorm because I was not a saved boy. But that morning, Jesus Christ, that evening rather, Christ was exalted. I saw Jesus Christ on Calvary. I realized there that He died for my sins. I realized that the only way for me to be right with God was not through a church, not through a preacher, not through a song, not through a memorization, but by bringing myself humbly to Him and saying, I'm a lost sinner needing a Savior. Please save me. And He did. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Have you been saved? Were you there? You say, well, preacher, you know, I grew up in church. I didn't ask you that. I didn't ask you that. So, preacher, I was sprinkled. I was confirmed. I didn't ask you that. But, preacher, I've been baptized. I didn't ask you that. Well, I'm asking you this, and if I could today go from individual to individual, I wouldn't be quite as excited in it. Well, I'd be excited. I wouldn't be quite as loud in it. But I'd look you in the eyeballs and I'd say, dear friend, would you please tell me that you know the one that I know of, the one who walked on the Sea of Galilee, the one who caused the blind to see, the lame to walk. Do you know that you know that he hung on a cross for your sins? Do you know that they buried him and three days later he arose from that grave and he arose victorious? Do you know that if you'll come to him in faith and say to him, I believe that you're the one who died. I believe that you're the one that lives and I believe that you did it for my sins. And right there, he'll grab you up in his arms and he'll say, hey, you're mine now. Ain't nobody going to get a hold of you. And let me tell you something, those that he has a hold of, he keeps. Won't you think for one moment that if he's powerful enough to save you, he's not powerful enough to keep you. His blood, his forgiveness, he knew exactly who he was getting when he bought you. He knew exactly what you were going to do, where you were going to go. And he said, I'll still take him. Remember, we use that as an expression of His love. Knowing that we were yet sinners, He did what? He died for us. He saved us. He loved us. He gave Himself for us. Now, I'm not going to today, but if we could, we'd start from this corner over here. I'd start with Brother Ernie. I know his testimony. I know Brother Carl's testimony. They've shared it with me. I know Brother Fred's testimony. He was driving a Volkswagen Beetle, skiing all the time, and he heard the gospel when he got saved, right? I know Brother Ron's testimony. I know Brother Josh's testimony. Hey, they could pop up and say, I know him. That's what we're talking about. That's the light. That's the light that turns our life around. It takes us from darkness and blindness. You see, the greatest lie that's ever been told is the lie of the enemy who tells a lost man, you're okay. He's telling you now, you're okay. You don't need anything that radical, loud, windbag of a guy is talking about. We got a few more minutes and we'll be done. We're going to Taco Bell. We're going to McDonald's, Burger King. You're okay. Don't take any of that stuff in. You're okay. But friend, let me tell you something. Without Jesus Christ, from God's perspective, you are not okay. When it's all said and done, why do you think man recoils against God? An authority. God, the authority of all. Because we want to do what we want to do and have our results. What a gracious God. You ever heard the expression, give them enough rope and they'll do what? Hang themselves. We've got a God who loves us, who gave himself for us, who wants to save us. He's gracious and merciful. He finds no satisfaction and us being away from Him. When He came to the garden to see Adam and Eve, His heart was broken. Fellowship of mankind. But God did something in mercy and tenderness. He gave us a visual picture there. Animals, innocent life was taken, blood was shed, and garments were made to cover the nakedness of Adam and Eve, their embarrassment. And God gave a pattern there. 
that bears out through the Scripture that God would provide a way for man to be covered. You cannot cover yourself. They covered themselves in leaves. Leaves that are disconnected from a tree, they dry up. And you'd have to keep covering yourself and covering yourself and covering yourself. There's only one who can cover us. That's why the prophets tell us and give description of salvation as they're being garments of praise, garments that cover us up. I've got a white robe, and it's no robe that I earned or I deserve. It's a white robe that Jesus purchased for me. Now when God sees me, how does He see me as a believer? He sees me in Christ. The enemy tries to say, you're okay. You're okay. But friend, if you've never come to Jesus in faith for salvation, you're not okay. I would come to you today and I would plead with you. That's the light that all men need. Whether they realize it or not, that's the light. We've got to break through the darkness. We've got to break through the deceit. We've got to break through the lies. We've got to lovingly, gracefully lead people and explain to them these things. They need to know it. They need to hear it. How shall they hear? Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. We rejoice in that. But the follow-up verse that is verse 14 is, How shall they hear? How can they believe if they haven't heard? How shall they hear without a... That's where they need us. Your grandchildren. Your children. Your neighbor. Your co-worker. Your childhood friend. Then they know the Lord. They need the light. That's the first thing I can do. I can bring light. Then they need the might. What are we talking about the might? That's the power of God. Remember that verse that said to turn from the power of Satan to turn to what? To God. That's God's power. Friend, when you get saved, you get plugged into a new source. Right? That's the power source from God. And that's how we live. That's how we forgive people. So I don't know how in the world you could ever forgive somebody. I don't know how in the world you could ever love somebody. I don't know how in the world you people give up so much of your time and give up so much of your life. How in the world are you doing that? You don't know my source. You don't know where I'm drawing my juice from. You don't know my power. That's the might. When you begin to explain to people that, hey, that verse that we used earlier on, greater is he that is in you. That's how you get victory over sin. That's how you love your wife. That's how you love your husband. That's how you raise your children. That's how you go forward in life. That's how you're teaching those who stole to steal no more, but rather to work with their hands that they might be able to provide for others. That's the power of God. Light, might, and right. People need to know how to live righteously. They need to know how to live right. They don't know. You say, we're so helpless in this world. No, we're not. I have something. I got light, might, and right. But what we lack is fight. That's what the Paul was directed to tell Timothy, right? Fight the good fight. It's a fight. In our life, and man, if we're going to go out and do something in the world, if we're going to go out and share the gospel, you're going to get kicked back, pushed back, pulled back, talked about, and everything else. You go to work and lay out some gospel tracts and start sharing the gospel with people on lunch break. I'm not telling you not to do your job in order to do that. Don't be that person. You go to work and work harder than everybody else around you. You be the hardest working person there, and then when they're sitting at lunchtime, you open up your Bible, and they begin to look at your life, and because you work hard, and because you have a good attitude, you're a good employee, and not the big mouth on the job that hinders everything, they say, hey, what's the difference in that guy? Hey, right here's the difference. There's the difference. When you have opportunity to share your faith with them, man, oh man, when you do that, it is a fight. But it is the what fight? It's the good fight. Everybody's fighting something. Everybody's getting pushed back on something. I just uh, would encourage you to decide today to fight the, the good fight. The good fight. The one we're fighting for. The one that someday, when we stand before the captain of our salvation... Maybe we'll hear something like this said to us. Well done. The Apostle Paul, in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said, I have fought a good fight. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me, what? A crown of righteousness. I can do something. Light, might, and right. I'm careful with the fight thing because I don't want you to go home and start fighting with your wife. But I think the Lord can use us that way. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Can we? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. So appreciative this morning of your attendance and your attentiveness. Well, I desire today if you're here this morning and you say, Preacher, there is something going on in my heart. I am not saved. 
I, I don't know that. You spoke of a testimony of salvation. I don't have that, but I would really like to know that. I would like to have that settled. Right here in this place today, I'd like to get that settled. Preacher, like you did when you were in the junior high, you had heard the gospel many, many times, but it, it, came, it came together. It made sense that evening. Why the gospel? Because I'm a sinner and because my sins separate me from God and the only one that can save me is Jesus Christ. And when I turn to Him and believe He's my Savior and He paid for my sins, according to the Scripture, He paid the sin debt, He defeated death, and there is in Christ security. There is the forgiveness of sins. Right there at your seat this morning, if you're here today, and you'd say, Preacher, right here, right now, I know my need for Jesus to be my Savior, and I want to receive Him as my Savior. Right here today, you'd say, Preacher, please pray for me. I want to. Right here at my seat right now, I'd like to be saved. I want to know that. I want to leave here today knowing Jesus and knowing that it's settled in my life. Would you lift your hand that I might pray for you? you say, Preacher, I don't know that, but I'd like to know that today. I'd like to get that settled. Would you raise your hand? Let me pray with you. Who would say that today? Preacher, I, right here, right now, I'd like to get that settled. I'd like to leave here this morning after hearing the gospel. Now, friend, listen, if you don't know that, please don't reject it. Don't push it away. Don't turn it away. Maybe you have questions about it. I can understand that. Maybe there's things you don't understand. I get that. Let us help you with that. We desire today that you would know Jesus as your Savior. Who's here this morning? You say, Preacher, I know Christ is my Savior. I'm rejoicing in my salvation today. Would you lift your hand? You say, Preacher, I know Him as my Savior. Raise your hand and rejoice in that. Wonderful. Friend, I'll not embarrass you for one moment, but if you could not raise your hand, please, 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 make this the day. Just like I did. And I didn't make it. The Lord did it. I believed on Him. If you don't know Him today, let somebody help you with that. Perhaps this morning you're saved, but you say, Preacher, I need to be surrendered. I need to come over. I need to enter in. I, I get it. I understand the concept here. There's something to this. Maybe there's a young person today. Say, Boy, Preacher, there's a desire in my heart to help others and to bring the gospel to them. How can I help people? Man, light, might, and right. The Lord will use us, I believe, if we're surrendered to Him. Who would say this today? Preacher, I want to be more surrendered to the Lord in my life. Would you raise your hand? I want to be used by Him. Wonderful. Here in just a moment, we'll stand to our feet. We'll have a time of invitation. The pianist will play. If you raise your hand this morning and say, Boy, Preacher, the Lord's dealing with my heart about something, come to the altar today. Spend some time in prayer. Maybe you're praying for somebody or about some situation. Perhaps today you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and you have questions. Why don't you come today and let someone show you there are men, there are ladies who would be glad to sit with you and take all the time in the world to share the gospel with you. It's our desire today that you would know Jesus. Maybe today it's a matter of surrendering in a different way of service in your life. However it may be, have the Lord leads. I trust that you'll respond to Him. Let's stand to our feet, please.